Okay, folks, we can get going. Um, so I mentioned early on in the semester that at some point in this semester, we would transition from having lectures to instead just having more lab time. And that transition is going to occur at the end of this week. And so I'm going to lecture through Friday and then starting on Monday, and instead of coming here to lecture, we can all just meet in the lab and get some more time working on final projects. So in this week, I have some sort of special topics and loose ends that I'd like to wrap up. The first thing I'd like to talk about is you may remember way back on the first day of lecture that I told you that my goal in this class was not necessarily to convince you that you should love microcontrollers. It might be the case that some of you leave this class loving microcontrollers, and that's awesome. Um, but it might instead be the case that some of you leave this class going, oh, that's not really my cup of tea. And that's awesome, too, because we need engineers of all kinds of varieties. Um, but regardless of which camp you might fall into, one, one piece of learning that I do hope that you leave this class with is an understanding of what it is that people love about microcontrollers. It's a good practice in general, right? Even for the things that you yourself might not be super passionate about or that you might not love, it's good to try to gain an understanding of what it is that people do love about that thing. And to that end, I'd like to try, and it's going to be hard, <laughs> but I'd like to try to explain what it is that I love about these things. Um, and I saved this discussion for the last day of class because I, I thought about doing this on the first day of class, right? And using this as sort of the way to set the tone for the whole semester. But it occurred to me that perhaps after you know, eight or nine weeks of working this, with these devices, it might be the case that some of these feelings maybe resonate with some of you, or at very least are perhaps a little bit more comprehensible to some of you now that you've gotten some, a lot of experience working with these kinds of devices. And so that's why I've saved this discussion for, for the end of class instead of the beginning. Um, and I want to say, too, that I have never given this presentation, and it's a really hard one to give. It's hard because I'm going to try to explain why I love something that I love. And if you've ever tried to explain why you love someone that you love, you'll realize how difficult that is. There's a lot of stuff that's really hard to articulate about what it is about this thing or about this person that you love so much, um, which is just to say that you might find that this particular lecture, if it seems a little rambling or if it's not quite as clear as it might eventually be or not quite as concise as it could eventually be, uh, it's because I'm still trying to figure out how to explain this stuff. And any help that you might be able to provide, you know, in order to say these things a little bit better or a little bit more concisely, I would really appreciate. And so that is all just to say that I hope that this is more conversation than anything else. I'm going to sort of throw some ideas out there, but if folks would like to discuss it, I'd be very happy to discuss those ideas. So in particular, what I'd like to talk about is, first of all, in general, why I feel like it's important to do engineering projects, that is to be building things, why it's important to build things. And after having discussed that, I want to talk about why I like embedded systems and microcontrollers in particular. Um, and then these last two bullets, we'll see if we get there or not. Um, but I really want to talk about those first two things. And in connection to that first topic, there are sort of two kinds of answers to this question. Why should you build things? There's a whole set of practical answers to this question, like reasons that it's a good strategic idea as a young engineer trying to go start a career in engineering. It's a strategic to do lots of building things. And I want to touch upon that, but because of who you all are, it seems to me like that's kind of, it would be boring to talk about. I think you guys know all that stuff. Um, there's a whole sort of separate set of answers to that question that are my personal answers. And that's what I'd like to talk a little bit more about and which I will have some trouble putting into words, but maybe you all can help me. Um, so let's start by just touching upon those practical reasons. Why is it a good, good idea to build things? Well, if you're an engineer, building things is engineering. <laughs> um, building things requires a lot of stuff that isn't engineering. It requires a lot of mathematical modeling, requires a lot of simulation. That stuff's really, really important. And in order to get something built correctly, you need to do all that stuff. It's really critical. But engineering is the building of the thing, right? And so to the extent that you want to be hired as an engineer, it's a good idea to have an engineering portfolio, a collection of projects that you yourself have built and that you can talk about. There's, now maybe this is not, everyone might not share this opinion. Maybe this is just my opinion, but it seems to me that the most important evidence for your competence as an engineer is a project portfolio. And I think there's a reason for that. Uh, I think the reason 
This is something that you have all spent the last eight or nine weeks discovering. Building things is really goddamn hard. It's really hard to get something to work. Nothing ever just works. Um, and if you get into the habit of doing this sort of habitually, just always be trying to get things to work, to build things that work, it demonstrates, remember, this is the practical set of reasons, it demonstrates to someone who might be considering, you know, hiring you to be an engineer, that you are familiar with all the levels of abstraction in engineering. Like I talked about, there's a lot of stuff that isn't engineering that's required in order to actually build something that works, right? There's, you have to have an understanding of the model of the system, you have to plan what you're going to do, you have to understand how to test it to see if it's working. Those are all sorts of different levels of abstraction. And if you have actually built stuff that works, it's good demonstration that you're familiar with all those different levels of abstraction, right? So for instance, it's a good indication that you won't design things that can't be built, right? If you are in the practice of building things, maybe that's an indication that you know how to design things that can in fact be built, which is a skill. Furthermore, it gives you, I'm not sure if this is the right word, credibility or something. What I'm actually talking about here, this is coming from my own sort of personal experience in more of a research setting, is if you choose to go do engineering in a research context, say you go get a PhD or something like that, um, what you'll find is that there's a whole bunch of, re a bunch of engineering research that takes place in sort of the simulation world. And that's for good reason, right? Um, it's a good idea to simulate things before you build them, obviously, because it's way less expensive to build a simulation than it is to build a Mars rover, for instance. Um, there's some other reasons too that I think are a little bit more, uh, I don't know what word to use, slightly sneaky. It is the case in a research environment that part of your, um, one of the metrics upon which you are evaluated is your quantity of publications. How many publications are you making per year? You can generate publications based on simulation far faster than you can generate publications based on real hardware because it's really hard to build real hardware and it takes a long time. But this is what I'm sort of pointing out with credibility here. If you do that, right? So what it costs you is time in a research context, but this is true in industry as well. It costs you time. It's hard to build something that works in the real world. It takes a lot of time. But if you do, and if you go into your dissertation defense or your presentation or whatever it is, and you put the thing on the table and it's working, everyone shuts up. <laughs> There's nothing more to be said. Right? If by contrast you present a simulation, there will, I promise you, always be at least one person that raises their hand and goes, well, did you account for this in your simulation? And maybe your answer is yes, or maybe your answer is no. But if your answer is yes, there's going to be another raised hand that says, well, yes, but did you account for this? And at some point, the answer is no. And you can make a really good argument about where you decided to stop modeling. Right? But no matter where, no, no matter how good that argument is, there's going to be a handful of people in the room that fold their hands and go, well, he didn't even account for that in the simulation, right? If you actually build something that works in the physical world, there is no simulation. It works in physical reality, right? And there's something really powerful about that. Um, and I think this is important too. If you're in the practice of building things, which is an incredibly humbling process, it's so fraught with failure, right? All the time you really start to gain a different kind of appreciation of the constructed world around you, right? We have a tendency, technology is at a point in, anymore where the technology with which we interact on a daily basis tends to just work. Most of the stuff that we interact with just works. And it can be easy to forget how miraculous that is, how hard it is to get anything to work. And if you're in the practice of constantly trying to get stuff to work and failing and trying again and failing and trying again until you get this thing to finally do what it is that you want for it to do, you're left with a really deep humility about the whole manufactured world. And this is a little bit dramatic, but it's kind of true. Like you're going to be in awe of things like keyboards, right? These silly little overlooked pieces of technology. It becomes amazing to you that this thing is as reliable it is, as it is, right? It's, it's, I think it, it's good. It gives you a good perception of the manufactured world, I think. And, um, you know, so this is all the practical stuff. And one thing that I just want to point out here is that as an engineering student here at Cornell, you're going to learn, you have learned a specific kind of engineering. In particular, you've learned how to use engineering to solve problems. And that's the way that it should be, right? The reason it should be that way is, well, first of all, when you leave here, that's what you'll be paid to do. 
right? That, so we should train you for that, right? You're going to be paid to solve problems with engineering. And furthermore, as a trained engineer, you have, a, you have assumed a tremendous power. You have the ability to change the world in a material way. That's a really powerful capability that needs to be taken incredibly seriously. With the ability to change the world in a material way, it is your responsibility to make sure that you are changing it for the better. And in order to make certain that you're doing that, there's a certain engineering process involved. If you're trying to change the world for the better, the first thing you better decide on is, well, what are we going to build, right? That usually takes the form of a whole bunch of requirements. And then there needs to be a whole systematic process by which you make sure we are building what we intended to build. We're not accidentally building something that's different, that's perhaps dangerous or cataclysmic, right? Um, so there's a whole process by which we make sure what we are building is what we want to build. And another process by which we decide what it is that we're going to build in the first place, right? So this is what you should learn in a place like this. Um, there are other flavors of engineering, and it's these other flavors that I want to talk about a little bit, because if I'm honest with you, when I'm doing personal engineering projects, sometimes they're of this variety, and sometimes they're of a slightly different variety. So you could say that projects of this variety are those which change the world, and I love those. We should learn how to do those. There's a whole other category of engineering projects, which are those that change your perception of the world. It's very different, and I want to talk about that one a little bit as well. So I, that's, you know, a brief summary of why should you build stuff? Those are things that are obvious to you, I think. What I want to talk about now is um, why I love building stuff. And this is a slightly different set of reasons. Um, you know, and I'm telling you this for a few reasons. One is it took me until quite a long time in my I'm st still doing a lot of engineering development, right? But it took me a, a quite a few years into my sort of time as an engineer to start to find this kind of engineering. And since I found it, I've been very glad that I did. <laughs> it has given me a different appreciation for engineering. It has, I think, made learning new engineering concepts easier for me and has changed the way that I look at the world in a way that I am grateful for. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that that might be true for any of you, I want to talk about it. And furthermore, I just... This is the kind of stuff that I really like talking about with my colleagues and with friends and with students and so forth. And so I want to talk about it with all of you. So why do I personally think it's important to build things? Why do I love engineering? Um, engineering is a mechanism for solving problems, but it needn't only be that. We, 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 we can change the world with engineering, but we can also change our perception of the world with engineering. And both, I think, are really, really powerful things to do. So the way that I have come to think about engineering is a lot like reading. I've talked about this a little bit in the past. And in fact, a lot of the stuff that I'm saying up here, you may have heard me allude to throughout the semester because it's difficult for this stuff not to leak in right, to lectures and content and so forth. But I think about engineering at this point a lot like reading in that there is a time in your life where you are learning to read. And the stuff that you are reading, you're reading that stuff to get better at the skill of reading, right? At some point, however, a transition occurs where you are no longer reading to learn how to read. What you're doing instead is reading a book to learn about whatever the content is that's in that book. If it's a history book, you're reading to learn about history. If it's a book about birds, you're reading to learn about birds. If it's just a story, you're reading to learn that story. Now, in the process of doing that, you're getting better at reading. It's making you a better reader to read these books, but that's not why you're reading the books. You're reading the books to learn about whatever content the book happens to be, to be discussing. I think about engineering is exact, in exactly the same way at this point, where I like to use engineering as the mechanism by which I learn about other stuff, right? So that you... There is evidence of this in the laboratory assignments for this class, right? It's become obvious to all of you that I have an interest in birds and bioacoustics. The lab in this class is the lab in this class because that was a personal project. I'm interested in bird songs. I think they're interesting. The mechanism by which one can learn about something like bird songs, there's a few of them. You can read books about it, and you should, right? You can watch documentaries. You can listen to podcasts, and you can build stuff. You can engineer stuff. 
I really like that as a mechanism for learning about these other things because it gives you a different kind of appreciation for this thing that you're interested in than any of the other mechanisms. The Bird Labs is an example of that, right? You, you read books about bird songs and they're, they're very interesting, but there's sort of um, connections to one's engineering brain that are left unconnected. And so for instance, if you build a device based on bird songs, you start to notice the similarities to like code division, multiple access and cell phones. You're not gonna get that from a book, right? You can only get that kind of, those kinds of connections by building things. Same is true of flocking, right? The flocking behavior where you gain a different kind of appreciation for this thing by using engineering as the mechanism by which you explore it, as opposed to any of these other mechanisms, which are also valuable, but just give you a different kind of appreciation of this thing. I like the kind of appreciation that comes from building things. And, you know, it's, um, what to say about this? There's, I've had discussions of this variety with a lot of my colleagues, and you get mixed feedback. Um, every now and then, you will encounter a philosophy of the variety that um, an interest in a lot of different things is somehow an indication of a lack of interest in your area of specialty, right? I, I worry about this. There's sort of a, uh, there's a hyper-specialization that's occurring. And specialization is a good thing, but it does sometimes come at a cost, right? I think about this, my sort of visual picture for this is, you know, in previous centuries, it used to be the case that you might be specializing in, say, engineering. And so you'd be walking along this path towards the frontier of engineering as you learned more. But as you were walking, the walls which separated you from the paths associated with neurobiology and with mathematics and with other kinds of engineering, they were low. And you could kind of walk your path and peek over and see what was going on over there. And it seems like one of the consequences of this hyper-specialization is that those walls have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's hard anymore to be walking on your path and to be able to peek over that wall and see what's going on over in ornithology or one of these other interesting fields of study that's doing a lot of stuff that's related. And that, you know, you might have a unique take on giving your area, especially, it's hard to do that because of specialization. And every now and then you'll, you'll meet folks who are kind of against that because they want to get to the frontier of their area of specialty as fast as they can. And interest in these other things can seem like a distraction. I don't think that it is a distraction. I think it's productive. But there is a feeling that it, it kind of seems like one. Um, I wonder sometimes, for instance, someone like a, uh, oh gosh, you could use a whole bunch of different examples, but someone like an Alan Turing, right? Alan Turing was interested in everything. He ha one of those things happened to be computing, and computing was born, right? But he was also interested in a whole bunch of other stuff. And I sometimes play this game with myself where, like, if an early career Alan Turing came and tried to get a job in this department or that department or the other department and stood up in front of a panel of professors and said, I'm interested in computing and I'm interested in this thing in nature and I'm interested in chemistry, I worry sometimes that they'd go, you seem a little distracted, <laughs> right? Um, but I don't think that's the case. I think, in fact, I think, in fact, having a diversity of interests and exploring that diversity of interests through your area of specialty makes you better at that area of specialty. And I have a silly example of this. Not silly, actually. Um, I have a fascination with Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and there's an amazing book, which I strongly recommend that all of you read. It's a biography of Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson. And in one of those chapters, he talks about the Mona Lisa. I want to talk about for just a little bit, but there's this amazing quote from him. So, so da Vinci, da Vinci was one of these distracted people. Da Vinci was one of the greatest painters to have ever lived, but we don't have that many paintings from da Vinci. <laughs> we have precious few. And to some extent, that's kind of a bummer, right? They're so amazing that you wish that, God, I wish that guy had just done a little bit more painting. But what was he doing instead? He was spending decades in a morgue, piecing apart cadavers, trying to understand how muscles work, how bones work, how everything connects in the human body. He spent years studying shadows and how light bounces off of different shaped surfaces. He spent years studying uh, various things in nature. He was obsessed with birds. He was obsessed with flowers. Um, and all of that time that he was studying those things, he wasn't 
painting, right? And so there is admittedly a very small group, but there does exist a group of sort of modern scholars and critics who kind of are bummed out that da Vinci spent all this time doing all this other stuff. And Isaacson has this quote that I just adore, which is, and what about the scholars and critics over the years who despaired that Leonardo squandered too much time immersed in studying optics and anatomy and the patterns of the cosmos? The Mona Lisa answers them with a smile. I want to talk about the Mona Lisa a little bit, but this is, you know, in the conversation for being one of the greatest pieces of art that humankind has ever created. It's almost too famous. It's so famous that it's become its own cliche almost, but it is famous for a reason. It's famous because it is spectacular in a variety of ways, and it's spectacular in ways that only a person like Leonardo, only a person who spent time, quote, distracted by all these other things, only he could have created something like this. And so there's thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of Leonardo's notebooks. This is just a collection of some of the interesting ones, I think. These are some of his studies of shadows, all of which became relevant for the Mona Lisa. He has a study up here of a cadaver where he was studying how muscles attach to the lips. How does a smile actually form? He's trying to figure this out. All kinds of studies of the human body, studies of how light bounces off of faces, this is only tangentially relevant. I included this just of interest. This is the last page in the last notebook that Leonardo ever wrote at the end of his life. He spent his whole life obsessed with this problem of trying to uh, square the circle, a little geometrical puzzle. Spent years, years, years studying this thing. Um, on the last page, he's continuing to do this. And the, uh, he's, going, he's attempting to go through this whole proof and then it cuts off abruptly. And he just ends it with a comma, et cetera, period. And then the last thing he writes but is, but anyway, my soup is getting cold. And that's the last thing that we have from Leonardo. His soup was getting cold, so he put his pen down. Um, my point here is only a person with this many interests could generate the Mona Lisa. Only someone who was distracted by all this stuff could generate something like that. So they weren't distractions. They made him a better painter. They made him a better engineer. They made him a better scientist. And they made him a better architect. And I think this holds true for all of us, right? I think having a diversity of interests and exploring those interests by means of engineering makes us better engineers. I want to just point out a couple of interesting things about the Mona Lisa. Just as an example of, you know, how amazing this is, um, one of the things that Leonardo spent a bunch of time studying, a bunch of time, was how perception works. And what he realized was that we have a very small region that we can focus on with our eyes. And when we focus on that region with our eyes, we get all the detail from that region. But then the area around that region, the sort of peripheral vision, we get a blurred version, a low past version. The most famous part of Mona Lisa is her smile. Part of what makes this smile so interesting is you can't catch it. If you look directly at her mouth, the smile kind of goes away. If you instead look up at her eyes, it flits back. So you can't catch the smile. It's disappearing and reappearing all the time. If you spend some time staring at the Mona Lisa, you'll start to notice this. The smile is hard to catch. The reason for this, this was intentional on Leonardo's part. He knew, he knew that when you focused on something, you got all the details. And when you looked away from it, you got a low past version. So he put the smile in the lower spatial frequencies. If you low pass the Mona Lisa, it's kind of hard to see here. If you low pass the Mona Lisa, the smile becomes more obvious because the shadows are suggestive of a smile. And you see the shadows when you look into her eyes. When you look at the mouth and you see the details, the smile kind of goes away. It's less suggestive of a smile. He knew this. <laughs> it, was, it was all intentional. The other just brief and amazing thing that I'll mention about it is, is he was obsessed with capturing motion. And so what we're noticing, right, she, she was just looking that way and she's just turned to look at us. That's the moment that has been captured here. The light's coming from over here. And so that pupil should be less dilated than the other pupil. And Leonardo was that obsessive. If you look at his other paintings, he's got the dilation of the pupils correct given the incident light. But it's not here. And it, it's, he's so detail oriented that people have questioned since then, what, what's the message? Was this truly a mistake? Probably not. He wouldn't have done something like that. So what's the message? 
So, so why is this pupil not as undilated as it should be? Why is it more dilated than it should be? People think that there's one of two, this, this could be for one of two reasons. The first reason is, this is a, a portrait of uh, Lisa Del Jaconda, it's a woman. She may have had, um, the word is, I wrote it down, anisocoria, asymmetric pupils, 20% of people do. She might have been one of those people that has asymmetric pupils, and this was an accurate representation of what her eye looked like. The other possibility, which I think is just fabulous, is the other thing that da Vinci had studied was the conditions under which pupils dilate. As many of you are likely aware, your pupils dilate when you see something that makes you happy. If you look at someone that you love, your, your pupils will dilate. It might be possible that he's communicating that she's happy to see us, that maybe she turned her head and saw us and her pupil dilated a little bit and she's happy to see us. That's the other possibility. Yeah, the smile's amazing. And so the way that I think about this, I'm sort of, like I said, this is a little bit rambling. This is not exactly concise, so I'm saying the same thing over and over again. The way that I think about these engineering projects is as filter removers. Most of what your brain is doing all the time is filtering stuff away from your consciousness, right? You're not actually noticing almost anything that's around you because your brain is filtering it away as being irrelevant. If you do these engineering projects, you start to notice and appreciate these things that have always been there, but that your brain has been filtering away from your conscious mind. Maybe for some of you, Lab One's an example of this. You spend some time studying bird songs, you start to hear birds singing. It's the weirdest thing, right? But this, this is, extends to everything. Maybe it's true for some of you in the case of Lab Two with birds flocking, right? You suddenly start to notice this flocking behavior all over the place. Um, the more you know about this stuff, the more that you notice. And particularly in nature, nature's so interesting. Nature's so interesting because there's an order to nature. Like we, to some extent, we can predict what's going to happen in nature, right? That's why we can do things like land stuff on the moon. You have to have a pretty good idea of how, what's of cause and effect, right? <laughs> to get something like that onto the surface of the moon. But there's chaos too, out beyond a certain time threshold, in particular in some, in some pockets of nature, it's really hard to predict what's gonna go on. And so for me, this is so analogous to like a really nice piece of music. What makes a really nice piece of music nice to listen to is this interplay between order and chaos. It's not completely unpredictable. If it were completely unpredictable, it'd be horrible to listen to. It'd be like white noise or just like a random collection of notes. So there's a predictable element to it. You have some sense of what it's going to do, but there's chaos there, right? You, it, if it were, if you knew exactly what the next note was going to be all the time, it would, again, be a very boring song to listen to. And so in a good piece of music, you get this interplay between there's some order, there's some chaos. You see that in nature as well. So my mental model for this, the way that I think about this is all around in all these little pockets of nature where there's order playing with chaos, it's like there's a little song playing right there. And if you do these engineering projects that lift your filter, you get to hear that music, right? You get to hear the music associated with bird songs. You get to hear the music associated with flocking, right? Or with all these other things. You don't perhaps get to understand every note, right? It might be the case that you spend your whole career specializing in trying to understand some pocket of nature. And then you know every note of that song associated with that pocket of nature. We don't get that with these projects, but at least we get to hear the music. Right. And so there's this question of like, and this is a personal question that everybody has their own answer to, but it's worth pondering for yourself. What is the meaning of life? Right. What what is the meaning of life? For me, this is a big part of it. I don't care. Well, it's not that I don't care. I don't need to know every note of every song playing in every corner of nature, but I want to hear as much of that music as I can. There's something that feels very meaningful to me about that. And engineering projects have been, in my experience, one of the best ways of making that music available to myself. Okay. So that's why I like engineering projects. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons that I like them. So, but everything that I've said applies to engineering in general. What is it that is so special to me about embedded system projects in particular? I think there's stuff that makes these unique. There's a reason that sort of I have found myself gravitating towards this particular little niche of engineering. It has some properties that I really enjoy. And that I've alluded to, you know, in previous, in previous lectures. The first is 
microcontrollers projects, embedded system projects, they're amazing vehicles to other fields and disciplines, right? So if you are a person who is interested in engineering and loves engineering, but for whom engineering is one item on a long list of items that you also love, right? Then this is a great kind of engineering to do because you can almost always find some mechanism of using a microcontroller or an embedded system to travel into this area of interest. If you're interested in music, there's, there's avenues into music from, from this place. If you're interested in birds, uh, if you're interested in art, like essentially anything, right? It has this nice property that you can use it as a vehicle and ride it to a whole bunch of different areas of discipline. There are other fields of study for which this is true. I, I, think, I think I would put math in this category. If you were really interested in math, you could use math to, as sort of your car, which takes you to a whole bunch of different places. But then there's a whole bunch of stuff where it's a little bit trickier to figure out how exactly you would use that as a vehicle into other things. If you're really interested in nuclear engineering, uh, it's hard to know how you might study bird songs with nuclear engineering. Maybe there's a way, but it's certainly not obvious to me. So it has, these projects have this nice property that they'll take you to all these interesting places. They allow for this kind of exploratory engineering that I, that I love so much. The other thing that I love about them is they're so constrained. It's amazing. So, so constraints are so nice. It's, it's almost counterintuitive, particularly if you haven't been doing this stuff this long, where constraints feel like annoyances. But in fact, they're not. So I love the fact that these little microcontrollers that we use, you only have a little bit of memory. You only have so many cycles. If you're doing some kind of real-time application, you, you have a real hard deadline for your computation has to be finished. So that means a couple of things. One is you have to understand the problem that you're trying to solve really deeply. You can't cut corners, right? Because you just don't have the resources to do it. You have to actually understand what you're doing. But, but even more importantly, it's only through constraints that you get creativity. And so embedded systems programming and embedded systems in general it's highly creative because it's so constrained we have to be so thoughtful about how we're organizing our hardware how we're getting our hardware to play with our software right all the pieces of this we have to be so thoughtful about it more so than we might have to be in some other kinds of engineering um i, I alluded to this in an earlier lecture and perhaps this is a little bit silly but it, it is actually the truth um you know in like high school at least in my high school in English class, you spend some time reading Shakespeare plays, and we read some Dante. Um, we, we read the Inferno. And I was always confused in those classes, like, why are these people, some of the greatest storytellers that we're aware of, why would they communicate in poetry? Why not just communicate in prose? Why, why not just say, you know, I'm the greatest storyteller that's ever lived. I'm just going to communicate. They didn't do that. They imposed constraints on themselves. They said, no, I'm communicating in poetry. I'm going to have verse. I'm going to have strict rules with regard to syllables. Highly, highly constrained. I would never dare speak for people like this, but I have this suspicion that they gave themselves the constraints in order to beget the creativity. I think that they probably enjoyed the constraints because that's how they got to exercise the creative parts of their brains. Maybe, maybe. And I think about embedded systems the same kind of way. It allows for us to exercise these creative parts of our engineering brains. The other thing I love about microcontrollers is they're just the right amount of complexity, I think. They're quite complex, as we've all discovered, right? I mean, the data sheet for the RP2040, which we're using in this class, is how long? 600 pages, something like that? That's a pretty fat book, right? But it's a book. It's about this thick. And if you were to internalize that book, you would have a pretty good understanding of that system at a pretty fundamental level, right? So it's, it's complex enough that you can always find these weird little avenues through the capabilities of the thing. You know, you can find these dark corners of the data sheet and you go, ooh, that's a, that'd be a sneaky way to do this, right? There's all these opportunities for sort of cleverness and creativity. There's enough complexity there to allow for you to approach problems from a variety of different ways and to think about problems in different ways. But it's not so much complexity that it's beyond the capacity of a human brain to like internalize it in, not to have it on your fingertips all the time, all the time necessarily, 
but to have a, a sufficient enough understanding of the system architecture that you could you can think about it like the whole system you can think about the whole system this is just not true of some other engineered systems that are that are amazing right but that are simply beyond the capacity of a single person saturn 5 rocket like one of my mach favorite machines to have ever been built, right? I love that machine. It's the coolest rocket ever. But there is no single person that lives or who has ever lived that fully understands how that system works. And that's a general property of a lot of the engineered systems with which we interact. Our cell phones. There is no single person who understands how that cell phone works. It is the product of a collective consciousness, a whole bunch of people coming together working on their area of specialty, being very careful about the interfaces between those areas of specialty to make a thing that it, nobody, no individual person understands how the whole thing works, but it works. That's a miracle in its own right, right? And I'm glad that people are building those kinds of machines. There's something to me that I find very satisfying about this level of complexity, right? I, we can hold it in our heads. It's, it's nice, it's a nice feature, I think, particularly for personal projects, right? It's really nice. Um, this is a little bit more practical, but you can be a novice in embedded systems and not kill yourself, right? That is not, that is not a property of all areas of engineering. If you want to go do at-home projects with high-power electronics, don't, right? Because if you make a mistake in high-power electronics, you will kill yourself or you will burn your house down, right? You will somehow maim yourself or those around you. In low-power electronics, Usually, I mean, of course, people can find exceptions to this, but generally speaking, the most dangerous thing that's going to occur is you're going to burn your fingers on a transistor, right? The, the stakes in terms of bodily harm remain relatively low, which is a nice feature because it allows for us to do sort of a little bit of exploratory engineering. We can try stuff and not be worried that we are going to die as a consequence. That's nice. And the other thing that I love about them, I love about them, is they sit in this interesting position between the natural world and the computational world, right? So these embedded systems, every system that we build in a class like this, it involves computation. You're writing programs which are running on a processor. And you're sort of living in this computational world, but it's an interesting view of that computational world. It's highly constrained, right? You're thinking very carefully about your computations in a way that you might not in some, some other kinds of programming, right? So you get this interesting view of the computational world, but then everything that we build usually is interacting in some way with the natural world. There's a sensor there, maybe, or there's actuators there, maybe. You're either sucking in information from the natural world and doing computation on it, or you're affecting actuators, which are changing the, the natural world. And so it puts you in conversation with physics in this really interesting way. You're in direct conversation with it in a, it, in a way that's hard to do in problem sets and textbooks and this kind of thing. You're interacting with physics in a very, very kind of direct, visceral sense. And I like, I like the relationship I like that. <laughs> I like the relationship that you end up having with physics when you're working with these kinds of systems. Um, you know, and you've all discovered this, where if you put everything together and you fire it up and it doesn't work, this is kind of a, it's a cool feature of debugging for these systems where the first question that you ask is, well, is this a problem with my software or is this a problem with my hardware or am I observing some consequence of physics? Right? It might have been the case, for instance, in lab three, that some of you had perfect software. Some of your schematics for the, the motor control circuit were perfectly fine from a schematic perspective, but it wasn't working because of the electromagnetic interference induced by the motor control wires onto your sensor wires. Physics was intervening in this whole process in a way that's really interesting. Right? And so debugging puts you in communication with computing. It puts you in, communicating, in communication with circuits, I think, in an interesting way, and hardware of all sorts of varieties. And it puts you in communication with physics, with the natural world. I think that makes these things really special, really, really special. How much time do we have? 10 more minutes. And so this is stuff that's old news to you. Uh, this was for a different audience. So. <laughs> Did I miss anything here? Do you think? 
are there any features of systems like this that, uh, that in your opinion, I have left sort of unrepresented? This was everything that I could, I've, I've been going through this exercise and trying to figure out, well, what is it about these things? Why are they so interesting? This is the best I can come up with at the moment. Okay, I hope that this conversation can continue. I'm gonna continue, continue to try to work this. These thoughts are still a little bit, um, some of them are still ill-developed in my own mind. I'm still trying to get them to crystallize. And to the extent that, you know, we can talk about this and help each other sort of crystallize these thoughts in one, another mind, one another's minds, I would be grateful. So, so the attempt here was to explain why I love these things. What I'm going to do in the next two lectures this week is on Wednesday, I would like to discuss, um, what I'd like to actually do is give you my PhD defense, uh, unmodified. And the reason I'm doing that is I've, I've done this, I did this last year, and uh, I've had conversations with a handful of you that are sort of thinking, do I want to do a PhD? Do I not want to do a PhD? And I have strong, very clear memories of being in a very similar situation. It would have been helpful to me at that point to get a sense of well, what the hell could this look like, right? And so to the extent that it might help you inform your own decision about do I want to do this or do I want to do something else, I'd like to just show you what a PhD in this kind of thing could look like with the understanding that they all look very different, right? Something like a PhD is highly university dependent and even more so advisor dependent, right? But I want to give you an example of what it could look like doing a graduate work in this and research in this kind of field. And then what I'd like to talk about on Friday, if you will indulge me, is um, some been thinking a lot lately about the relationship between computing and nature, relationship between computers and things that are going on in nature. And I've been trying to sort of develop these thoughts into some kind of a coherent set of not arguments, but ideas. And I have no idea if they're any good, <laughs> honest to God. And so what I would like to do is talk to you about some of these things that I've been pondering regarding the relationship between computing and nature computers and, and natural processes, and uh, hopefully have a conversation with it in which we can talk about whether this is interesting or not, because honest to God, I have no idea, right? It, if nothing else, maybe there'll be good premises for like sci-fi novels, but uh, they might not actually be practical in any way at all. So in any case, that's my plan for the coming two lectures. And then starting next week, we will stop meeting here and we will start just meeting together in lab so that folks have more time to work on final projects. Sounds good. Okay, I'll be in lab in 20 minutes.